What were your next orders after Pearl Harbor? Our next orders after Pearl Harbor, we in, after Pearl Harbor, we were there in, in Honolulu for eight, 18 months and in preparation to go into the South Pacific for in combat. At that time, we didn't know where we were going. There was two divisions and in, in stationed in Hawaii and the 24th Division and 25th. We was in, I was in the 24th. Uh, about uh, a year after Pearl Harbor, the 25th Division moved away out and went to Guadalcanal and uh, engaged in the Guadalcanal. And we stayed another six months after that. And then after that, 18, after six months passed, we went to, to uh, Australia to learn how to come off of a ship onto a landing craft, hit the beach, and, and uh, be uh, into combat. And then uh, from there, a short, very short period of time there, we moved on out to Hollandia. Uh, Hollandia was a harbor on the Pacific side and, uh, of, the, of, uh, of New Guinea. And the reason we took that position or was directed to take that position because Australians were on the other side of the island. And, uh, and they had been in there for quite a period of time. And uh, we were there to, to uh, reinforce their troops and, and give them the strength they needed to, to end that situation down there in, in, in uh, New Guinea. We landed there and the first week we were there, I think you wanted to mention that the fact that uh, uh, we, our positions was on the uh, on the bay and and overlooking the water, and we had gun positions, and these gun positions we had covered with camouflage nets to uh, so that the enemy couldn't see them. And a uh, uh, very short time after I was there, uh, uh, I was inspecting one of the gun positions, and uh, a uh, one of their artillery shells came down through the netting and hit me in the face and uh, knocked the teeth out in front. And uh, um, there, of course in combat, the situation was in, uh, we didn't ha have um, uh, that type of medics with us. We had t type of medics there that could dig a bullet out or, or take a stitch in you, but not, uh, not two. So, uh, then about the very short time after that, while well, we uh, were caught in the wrong place and was made prisoners of war, and uh, I was in it uh, three months and 20 days, and on the, the eventful thing I want to say about the camp, a lot of people have horrible stories about Japanese war, uh, prison camps, and there's no doubt about that those that were in the early part of the war and even after, in different situations might have been, uh, and, uh, their camp, like any other camp, was based upon the, the uh, attitude and uh, of the commander of, of the of the uh, camp. We were very fortunate that the the uh, commander of this camp knew that his time was limited. He he knew that he wasn't going to be in charge of that camp very long. That it was going to be taken back over by Americans. So we got first class treatment. Uh, in that respect, we we didn't have food. We uh, we had uh, uh, dried rice, rice and uh, egg, uh, eggs that had been dehydrated. That they had dehydrated, and they didn't really know how to do it. But at least they had they and uh, and the food process was such that I went from 158 down to 128 pounds before I was released. And of course, one part of it is the fact that I had these tooth problem and uh, the uh, one day I was up at the gate and, and a Japanese dentist named Ohara was there and uh, we got a little conversation between several of us and he turned to me and he said uh, I make I make and pointed to my tooth and so the, the commander of our troops we still had to obey our commanders even though we, they, they were in charge I went to him told him that they, uh, they had made the offer to put in there. And I, th I think he was a little suspicious that if I was put down in a, a dugout where they had the equipment to fix the tooth, that I might never come out alive. But uh, I was willing to take the risk. And uh, I went in, it was a uh, we went to a, a dugout and, and everything was uh, hand-driven. The, 
the, the, it was a Japanese fellow turned to crank to get the power to run the drill, to drill the teeth. And another guy was over, had a little Bunsen burner and he, he was uh, fixing the, the uh, gold to, uh, that they used to put the tooth in. So the end result is that they put the teeth in and I had uh, gold from eye tooth to eye tooth, uh, the whole one, the, the big tooth in the front, right in the front of my face. As I got back to my quarters, the rest of the day, of course, there was a, turned out to be quite a bit of pain. Uh, and, uh, but uh, the, by the mere fact that they didn't use any deadening material, they, they just worked on your tooth. And uh, then, of course, the next morning, uh, I got up, uh, uh, the, I was able to eat what little breakfast they had, I was able to eat. And, and, and uh, then uh, was about, uh, that was on, on about the second month. And then, then was there three months and 20 days. And, then, and the time I got out of there, I was, I was able to uh, eat uh, uh, the regular meals with them. Uh, and uh, this same O'Hara uh, occasionally would stop me in, in the compound and take a look at my tooth and say, oh, that, 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 it was good, you know. Uh, and so uh, that was the, the episode of that. And then when they, of course, when they, they gave me the first physical, it was on a boat coming back. They brought us back on a ship. And the first physical they gave me, the the uh, doctor, the dentist, when he looked in my mouth, he said, come look at this. And every dentist is on the boat and, and other doctors came and looked at what they had done. And after that, for the next 30 years, and every time, every year when I take my physical uh, in, in a, uh, dental office, every dentist would want to look at, look at what they had done. And then when, and when I came and to, to end the story about the tooth, when I was at Mather in 1954, and I went to work one morning and my lip was swelled from here to here and up to about here like that. And, and I went down to the dentist and uh, he looked at it and he said, you know, we've played with these long enough. He says, we're going to take your teeth out and put in complete new teeth because my loose bottom teeth had been knocked loose. They were, and, but they'd come back and it was all, all right, I could use them. But in, in order to do the complete job, they wanted to put in false teeth. So they made a, uh, the Dr. Kaler was a, a dentist and uh, he, uh, took the imprints uh, as they were. And then uh, they, 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 I went in, they pulled all my teeth and put the false teeth in. And I woke up on a couch with a brand new set of teeth. And I've had the same ones ever since. And they've been, they've never had to be adjusted or anything, which is a miracle. Most people have dental, dental work. They have to go back and back and get them filled and get them adjusted and get them and, uh, and have them, uh, to fit the gums and so forth. And I think uh, I saw Dr. Kaler maybe not over twice after that. And, and uh, so since then to now, uh, I've had the same same teeth. So what happened after New Guinea? Our regiment, practically all of it, uh, was relieved of duty and, and, and New Guinea and came back and came to Fort McDowell, San Francisco up to Camp Beale, which was a armored camp at that time, training uh, tankers. And, and I was at Beale long enough for us processed to go to the medic through the doctor's office and the hospital there. And they sent me to Oklahoma, really realizing that I'd have to go to the veterans hospital in Oklahoma to be operated on to remove a, the uh, problem that I had from being uh, shortage of well, bad food and so forth and getting, losing so much weight. As I related, I, I got down to 128 pounds, you know. And uh, of course, the thing that most guys had the same problem in, in different forms, because when we got on the ship, all they want to do is feed you everything. Do you like this? Do you like that? They, they don't want to cram you uh, with food so that we could get some weight back on us. And, 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 uh, in one way, it was probably the wrong thing to do. Uh, I don't think I overate or got, you know, gorged my food, but it was the fact that the, the, that this injury showed up 
and uh, they they knew that I had to have it re removed. So uh, the place that they, at that time was a veterans hospital in Oklahoma, Oklahoma City. So I went to there, and then I was there in the hospital uh, 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 nearly a month and so forth. After I got out of there, they they had a they were forming a new division, a Rainbow Division. Uh, uh, which was a World War One division and is re, -en re -en enacting it. The, the, the rainbow. So uh, there was, a, of course, a tremendous amount of publicity about it, and, and so I was assigned to the Rainbow Division. And as soon as the, while we were in the process of organi organizing the uh, companies, each company went in with the uh, uh, basic first sergeant. Uh, uh, platoon sergeants, company commander, platoon lieutenants, uh, 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 they were commanders, and then we so absorbed a hundred men, all right out of the, basically all of them right out of a boot camp at some place or another that had maybe anything from a month to two months training. They came in and uh, we formed a division. And uh, when, while they were forming the division, when I, I came back and was physically able, I came back to Sacramento, proposed to a little lady called Pauline Lupius, and then uh, I went back to, to Camp Gruber, as the name of it, and in August of that year, 1943, I called her father on the phone and asked if I could marry his daughter, and she, he said yes, so he put her on a train, and she traveled by train to Oklahoma City. I'd made preparations in a home for us to live in, and so then on August 10th of uh, 1943, uh, I had a military few, uh, wedding uh, with her in, at uh, Camp Gruber, Oklahoma. And of course she stayed there and at, uh, till I went to uh, Fort Benning, Georgia. And uh, that was 40, 44, early 44. I went to Fort Benning, Georgia for officer school. And she came to the back to Sacramento to be with her folks during that period of time. So from Camp Gruber, I went to Fort Benning, Georgia. And then from Fort Benning, Georgia, as I got out of there, I went to Augusta, Georgia, which was another army post. I was there a short time, and I, and I was uh, sent to Swift, Texas, which was a battalion of, uh, being prepared to go to Europe. So I sent for her and she came to Swift, Texas. Now we ran an apartment off, the, off of the post and the army furnished me transportation, a Jeep. And so we lived off the post and, uh, and, so, and she came out of the post and worked in the, in the uh, Red Cross building as a, as a, as a uh, steno. And so uh, we were there probably three months, maybe three and a half months and I, I got orders to move again. So she came back to Sacramento and I went to Lee, Virginia, which is Richmond. I got to Lee, Virginia, which is another officer school with different uh, training. And I was up there for three months and on uh, and, and Lee, Virginia, an officer. And I spent most of my time, well, the last uh, month of the three months, I spent most of it in Washington, D.C was on a, on a detail to, they were forming what is now known as the Pentagon. And those days, is a, first time I ever saw it, it was just a huge building with a whole lot of empty offices and, and they, we were there and while they were selecting the personnel to come and man the Pentagon. And as you know today, the Pentagon has, is a very, uh, prestigious place and, and, uh, and necessary to the military. So when I, uh, when I left Lee, Virginia, that was in, in uh, early, I guess in early, early uh, middle of July, Ju the, the war in, on, ended in August. And so I guess it was about, uh, I believe it's June, I got the record, but anyway, we'll, 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 say, we'll say it was for June. I came to uh, Utah and, uh, and uh, to a chemical warfare force base, and, and we built a base out there in the middle of the desert, 85 miles west of Provo, Utah, right out in the middle of nowhere. And uh, was that 
Yes, because of, on my birthday of that year in, 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 uh, at, at uh, Provo, that's when I went up to Mirror Lake for my birthday and high up now. We caught some trout and packed them in the snow on the side of the lake and uh, to make some pleasure with our endeavors. And of course she stayed here because uh, I didn't have quarters there. We all we all lived in, in the large tents until they, we got some structures going and houses built and so forth. And then from there, I came back to um, to Beale Air Force again, and I, I got to Beale, and they were, would there. That's where I had to make my decision of what I wanted to do, because we're now we're into at the end of forty five, in the end of the war, and uh, I had eighty five points. In fact, uh, I had more than that, but eighty five points was required for you to get out of the military if that's what you wanted to do. I'd made up my mind and looking around at what other people were doing, uh, other young men that was coming out that I knew, they came out, some had had uh, good intentions, they went back to school, some of them had uh, parents that they returned to and went in business with them and so forth. I had started on what they call bootstrap, which was a means of getting a degree, and we, we talked about that earlier. And so uh, I came back to, to, to uh, Beale, and then I lived off the base again. I lived in Port Chicago. You know where Port Chicago is? In the Bay Area? You remember getting hit by sh the sh ship that was blown, uh, an ammunition ship was blown up in Port Chicago? I, I was on, a, when I went to Port Chicago on a detail, at, and it was with uh, a, a big oil refinery, and my, my job there, I was put in an office, and uh, the first thing they did there was they started teaching me about how a refinery was constructed, and I would begin to question, why, why am I here to learn about the construction of a refinery? And pretty soon, the Mr. Black, who was ahead of it, one day was sitting at the desk, and he turned to me and he said, Sam, he said, I'm going to ask, answer a question that's probably been in your mind a long time since you've been here. He said, what you're here for and the reason you're sent here, you're going to, uh, along with uh, one other fellow, you people are going to audit our books and all errors that we have made, which cost Uncle Sam money, we will refund Uncle Sam the money that you declare it belongs to Uncle Sam. That... Uh, so we started in after I learned what a, how, what a catalytic cracker was and how it was designed and what went into it, the tanks and all that. So then Mr. Black, who was the head of the, the refinery, told me, he said, the reason you're here is when that explosion of that ship out in the ocean is in the bay there. It blew up pipes, wooden pipes that was bringing crude oil down the coast into, into the refinery. And uh, we had to, to scramble to get back into production because the, the military needed our oil and our gasoline. So one of the, one of the first tasks I got on was, was, it was I found out the pipes that they was bringing the refined oil into the refinery were wooden. They selected to put metal, which was the right thing to do, but if they didn't have a clearance for it, but they went ahead anyway and they put metal pipes down the coast into the refinery. So that expense, uh, expense uh, was uh, immediately identified as uh, uh, something that uh, they should repay the Uncle Sam for. The Cadillac, uh, one, of the, one of the towers of the Cadillac cracker was, uh, was uh, damaged and uh, we got into that part of that one and uh, to make a long story short, uh, I learned how to how a catalytic cracker. I learned how fuel was refined, and how we ended up having grades of oil and grades of gas, and, and because each of these steps were uh, integral parts of what I, we were looking at. So when we'd find a, a area that they would not have had necessarily. Uh, reproduced it, uh, re uh, repaired it, I should say, to the degree they did, but 
as Mr. Black said, the opportunity was there. We could get the money, we could get the material, which had been kept from us. So we did it. Now we're going to pay for it. So I spent from September, October, November, and December in Port Chicago. I came back then to uh, Bill on paper by name so they knew where I was at. And I was there, uh, assigned there for a, about uh, a week, and uh, they decided to, to, to take me to Mather Air Force Base. So in 1945, I came to Mather Air Force Base. I was at Mather Air Force Base from 1945 to, to 1950. What was it like living in the days of World War II? What were your emotions, and did you always think we were going to win? I had emotions. My emotions varied from from anger to hate to uh, thinking I was doing the best. It, it rotated around, and in, in basically, in, in the previous years, based upon the things that was happening to me. Uh, you, you don't like to use the word hate. You, uh, I, I never did like like to use it, but, uh, and I don't know as I personally hated the, uh, our enemy in the sense of that, but I had no respect for him. But, uh, so uh, my emotion, our emotions was really mixed at that time. Uh, when I came back and went to Camp Gruber, after I got out of the hospital, went to Camp Gruber and we formed the 24th of the, uh, Rainbow Division. This was a, a period of time that uh, our emotions ran strong according to how many people we were receiving, the type of people we were receiving to train, the uh, uh, demands was made from us, from our uh, people who was doing the training in the place where we lived. We, uh, I, I had quarters in town for my pride I lived, had, I had quarters on, on the base, which I lived in five days a week most of the time. And the weekends, when I get off, I'd go in. But those, those emotions was based upon uh, a lot of things. W one of the things I think that may, maybe I could delve into a little bit was the, the type of people we were getting that was draftees. We had people coming in to, to the service of the draftees that when you ask them to sign their name, they made an X. They didn't know how to didn't know how to even write. Uh, they couldn't write their name. We they would make an X and a mark, and the mark would vary from whatever they put down, and and then it would be recorded as his signature. We, uh, they couldn't read. We put them into what we called day rooms after hours. The day room is where they could get out of their barracks, out of their bunk and go to this day room where everybody was and be sociable. We tried to, to create a, in this day room, a interest of what uh, the young people wanted. And uh, one of the things I remember very, very vivid was the fact that uh, we went out and brought, asked for uh, uh, comic books, for example. We had all kinds of comics books and we'd bring them in and put them in the day room and they'd lay there and nobody would look at them. So we started teaching them to, uh, how to read. Uh, we'd have classes on uh, the alphabet. We'd have classes on uh, 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 pronunciation of words. Uh, so you'd be out there and with the troops training them and you'd say, when you'd say attention, we meant that you come to attention. That position was a that you would stand in attention with your hands by your side and so forth. And some of them, that you'd say attention to them and they look at you like, uh, what'd you say? Attention means you will come to attention. I think the stressful thing with with being a training, in the training of, of, of cadres like that in that time was the fact we had mixed group. Now, some of the kids that came in had, had the, uh, skills of reading and writing. Not, not all of them came into us that they couldn't read and write, but a good percent. So what we did was take these people who could read and write and, and uh, take them to the side and uh, tell them, hey, look, uh, 
John Stone, by name, different ones. How about you taking those guys and uh, uh, when we're off duty in the day room or even out in the field and you get a chance, talk to them about uh, how to, to uh, teach them how to, to write more than their name, write the alphabet, and uh, start late learning how to read and write. The biggest percent of them after six weeks, which was their first phase of training was six, six weeks. Most of them had, at the end of the six weeks, had learned to write their names. Not, not too legible they could write their names. Because we insisted, look, the Army's gonna pay you, and the way they pay you is they line you up in the line, and you go through the line at a table, and then the commanding officer is gonna call you by name and tell you how much money you get coming, and there's a board there, and you have to sign your name or you don't get your pay. And that was the biggest persuader of all, to learn to sign your name. We had some, one little fellow we had uh, called was a, was, a, was a barber. So we recruited him to take care of the, uh, these young men and see if they had proper haircuts and, and so forth. And uh, he, was, he was very intelligent. And he'd also, during his, his uh, course of doing that, he, he'd talk to them. Everybody did. Uh, well, I had one, one fellow that I recall was a little, he was a, a German by nationality and German by trait or, or attitude. And uh, he'd, he'd been his training and so forth. He came up to the rank of sergeant and uh, we had to watch him very close because his, his attitude of way to train a man was pin him against the wall and want to use hands and fists to pound into him that A is A and B is B. So finally, uh, I went to the commander and said, uh, we're gonna take that man's stripes and I want it made public that we've taken his stripes, not only in our company, but in the regiment. So if there's anybody else with that attitude that uh, he'll cease and, dis uh, and exist. But uh, uh, these are the things we had to cope with in, in training our, our people. You, you learned. We had, we had to teach, teach them how to turn their laundry in, when, you, when to change clothes, when, when to shine their shoes, when to scrub the floors, when to inspect their beds to see if they were made proper every morning. Uh, uh, our, our latrines were inspected as if they were your dining room. And we started teaching them to be clean, uh, orderly, and respect everybody's property the same way. Uh, and uh, this was a real challenge. So did you always think we were going to win the war? Absolutely. We, that was foremost in your mind that we were training our people to be superior to any other troops in, in, uh, in the world. And it was on one, the end of one thing of the war, that we would win the war. When we were going to win the war, that we didn't know, but we were going to win the war. And that was one of the other things that you put into these youngsters' mind. You are here to win the war. You're not here to be a soldier per se. You're here to be a military man with one thought, and that is I am going to do the best that I can as a soldier to win this war so I can go back home. But yes, we were going to win the war. Did you ever go to Alcatraz? Yes. Uh, when before I went overseas, I was stationed on Angel Island, which is out in our little bay out here. And, and it was a place where people came from all overseas to there. And we made, we filled uh, uh, the list and everybody was shipped out of there to their assigned stations. So one of the things that happened there was Alcatraz did the laundry for the military. So one morning, the uh, Colonel, Colonel Cole and uh, the first sergeant that I was under, we were standing at the right place at the right time. And, and uh, if something was said about riding the boat, and I said, yes, I've ridden that. It's called the Q9. I said, I've ridden that a few times. He said, l l get on the boat. You're going to go on a trip that you'll probably never forget. I said, what's that? And he said, you're going to go to Alcatraz and deliver this laundry. So we got on this little boat, went down to Alcatraz, pulled up to the pier, the dock. It was three gates. The first gate that was open, we unloaded our laundry at. Then we got off onto that pier, and then they opened the second gate, and we 
uh, uh, took the laundry and identified how many pants and how many shirts and so forth we had there. And then the prisoners of Alcatraz came down to the third gate. And when we closed the second gate, they came in and picked up the uh, clothing and so forth, took it onto the laundry. So yes, I was on Alcatraz in 1939. The Q9 went from Alcatraz, from uh, uh, Angel Island to San Francisco six times a day, and there's no telling how many times a day I rode that. Usually after roll call in the morning, and I'm finished with the little duties I was assigned to do, I turned to the uh, first sergeant in charge there. No guy had 30 years service, and, and, and so I said, permission to go to San Francisco. Yeah, yeah, son, go ahead. So I'd go down and catch the Q9 and go to San Francisco and prowl all through San Francisco in the old days. San Francisco then was different than San Francisco today. It, it was entirely different. And I can tell you about the, the places they had. Uh, uh, nearly all their beer joints, and, and, and in fact, and then most, a lot of the eating places were below street level in San Francisco at that time, you know, and, and they, uh, uh, but anyway, uh, but I, I just wanted to see San Francisco. I, we, I went all over San Francisco and then, then I'd come back and catch the Q9 back to, to uh, Angel Island. A little story goes along with that. This old sergeant, one time I was going over and he said, hey son, he said, on your way back is a little grocery store at Van Ness, right on Van Ness as you get off the streetcar to go down to, to get on the Q9. There's a little grocery store there and I got a package there. Would you pick it up? Uh, yes, sir, as long as they have a name on it, I sure will. So I picked it up and brought it on. And when I got off the boat, the MP said, what's the package? I said, package sealed. I said, it belongs to the first sergeant. I just picked it up for him. Well, I didn't realize it, but it, the, for the next two or three weeks that I was uh, there, about two times or three times a week, I picked up that sergeant's whiskey bottle. And I'd bring it back, because he couldn't buy any beer, he couldn't buy anything. He was alcoholic, he couldn't buy anything on the, on, 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 on the base, on the post. Here I was bringing, and he kept it down in the drawer. I found out where it was at and everything later on, but uh, so I ended up being a, a bootlegger. <laughs>